<laughs> For those of you listening in your car, if you haven't found channel 105.5, Go ahead and do that if you can hear me through the speakers, but you can listen on your radio if you'd like. 105.5. Those of you brave enough to sit out here in the cold, thanks for indulging us this morning. Um, you never know when you plan something for outdoors in October what you're going to get. It's not as bad as it could be, maybe not as good as some of you would like, but uh, we just wanted to try something different. The leaves are starting to turn, the sun is out. Uh, just kind of enjoy God's beauty as we worship and celebrate uh, together this morning. Uh, for those of you who watched this video at home because you were too wimpy to come out in the cold, I saw you at the football game Friday night and you didn't think it was too cold, so shame on you for not coming to church this morning. Um, I want you to think back, if you would, just a little bit to what it was like when you were in junior high. And you remember, I know that's a long time ago for some of you, okay? But you remember walking into the cafeteria in the midst of junior high and uh, everybody's got their assigned seats, right? It's kind of like coming to church. You got your assigned seat. You walk in the cafeteria and that table in the back corner, that's where all the football players and basketball players are sitting. And you go over, you kind of in the middle, there's, there's a table where all the band kids are hanging out and the choir kids are hanging out and they got their little group. And then up there by the, the register, you got the girls who are gonna someday be on the homecoming court. They're all the special popular girls and they got their thing going on. And everybody's kind of got their table. And I just want you to imagine for a moment in that dynamic, and maybe it wasn't quite that bad when you went to middle school, but you can picture that scene, I guess. Imagine for a moment what happens when somebody sits at the wrong table, right? When one of the kids who's on the, the academic challenge team and in the marching band goes down and sits at the basketball player table, fights might break out, right? Or imagine the scandal of one of the, the, the cool kids getting up from their table and going over and sitting with the kids who are kind of the outcast of the group. And everybody would start whispering and talking. It would be quite the scene because everybody has their own group and everybody's supposed to stay with their own group. And those are the rules. And we learn that from the time we're 10 years old all the way up through the rest of our lives. You find your group, you stay in your group, you don't go anywhere else. What's fascinating is in Jesus' day, they had groups too. Now, their groups came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Now, sometimes it was based on financial status. There were the haves, the wealthy 1%. They lived in these big, gorgeous homes. They threw lavish parties. They had, you know, the big four-wheel drive donkeys, you know, the whole nine yards. <laughs> all the extravagancies. But most of the population, they lived day to day they were one bad harvest away from not being able to pay their bills one bad harvest away from not having food for their family not being able to afford their taxes there were political boundaries there were those who really really actually kind of liked the roman occupation they thought the fact that the romans were there they paved roads they brought stability uh, they supported what rome was doing they were called the herodians because they supported king herod they loved what rome was doing some of them even went to work for him as tax collectors and business managers. And then there were those who hated the Roman occupation. We thought that they were the chosen people of Israel. They were supposed to be free and they were gonna do everything they could to set the people of Israel free. There were religious separations. There were those who believed that the most important thing in life was to make sure that you did everything the law said. They're personified by the Pharisees in your New Testament. They kept the rules, they made the sacrifices, they wore the right clothes, they ate all the right things, they went to all the right places. And then there were the not clean folks. Those who were either by vocation, because they were a tax collector or a shepherd, by disease like a leper, or by lifestyle choice, they were unclean. And so all of these boundaries were set up. And one of the remarkable things that we're gonna see here in a moment when we get into the main part of our message is that Jesus broke down every single one of those boundary walls. He had both a Herodian and a zealot in his disciples. He hung out with rich people and with poor people. He spent time with Pharisees and with tax collectors. He crossed every line. He was the one who got up and went from table to table in that middle school cafeteria and said, I'm gonna eat with you and I'm gonna eat with you and I'm gonna eat with you. And he crossed every possible boundary because from his perspective, it wasn't about whether you were liberal or conservative, whether you supported Rome or not, whether you were rich or poor. From his perspective, we're all in the same boat. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. All of us sinners in need of a savior. All of us sinners in need of grace. And so what we're gonna see as we dig into the book of Luke together and we walk through some of these scriptures is that Jesus consistently moved from table to table and offered grace to the Pharisees, to the tax collectors, to the prostitutes, to the Samaritans, to the Jews, to the Herodians, to the Zealots, to all people, he offered grace. And so that's where we're gonna begin our worship this morning. We're gonna begin by singing about the goodness of God, the grace of God, and our desperate need for what he has to offer. And my friend, John, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, Jesus had developed a bit of a reputation. In Luke chapter 7, when he's talking to some of the religious leaders of the day, they've criticized him for eating with sinners. And he says to them that John the Baptist came and he didn't eat or drink and you didn't like John the Baptist. And now the Son of Man has come eating and drinking and you call him a drunkard and a glutton. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but when I think the Sunday school pictures I get of Jesus, I, I don't remember any of my Sunday school teachers ever showing me a, a drunkard and glutton version of Jesus. But he developed this reputation of eating too much and drinking too much and feasting too much because he spent a lot of time eating meals, okay? This is why Jesus and I get along. I spent a lot of time <laughs> eating meals. I can't tell you how excited I am to preach a sermon that I entitled Eating Like Jesus. So this is right up my alley. I've never been more qualified in my life. I want to read to you a series of seven passages. And these are just a glimpse of the stories. Here's Luke chapter 5, verse 29. This is right after Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple. And it says, Then Levi, Matthew, hosted a grand banquet for Jesus at his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who ate with them. Then in Luke 7:36, Jesus is invited to dinner by a Pharisee named Simon. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. But then in Luke 10, he's with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Luke 10, 38. While they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed, to her, excuse me, welcomed him into her home. And then in Luke 11, 37, Jesus once again at an unnamed Pharisee's house this time. As he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. We don't know the story in Luke 15, but in Luke 15, verse 2, the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, all this man does is welcome sinners and eat with them. And then in Luke 22, 15, we get the Last Supper. And Jesus said to his disciples, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then in Luke 24, after the resurrection, Jesus is on his way to Emmaus with two men, and eventually he shares a meal with them. Luke 24, 30, it was as Jesus reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them that their eyes were open. And that's just seven of what could be, by my count, 16 different passages from the Gospel of Luke alone where I could show you Jesus at a meal. Now, sometimes it's stated explicitly, and sometimes it's kind of implied. For example, when Jesus fed 5,000 people, it doesn't say that he ate food with them, but he probably did, right? But when Jesus was, when Jesus was walking with his disciples along the road and they're plucking grain and they're eating it together, doesn't say that he ate with them, but there's a good chance that he did. When he went to the wedding feast at Cana, it doesn't say that he ate, but he probably did. And that's just from the Gospel of Luke. One of the things, if you just if you just kind of open the Gospels and start making tallies, you'll realize that nearly every story begins or ends with Jesus going to someone's house to eat. Again, I say I've never been so qualified to preach a sermon in my life. Jesus is my kind of guy. Why is Jesus doing this? Why is this such a part of the gospel story? Because I think, and I think you know this kind of intuitively, that when we sit down and share a meal with someone, more than just physical needs are met. There is something emotional and spiritual that takes place when you share a meal with someone. All the better if you share it in your home and you've prepared it for them. 
that there's a connection that's made. There's this sense of acceptance and belonging. There's a, a sense of validation that we're on the same team here. I've brought you to my table. We are in this together. There's just something, dare I say, supernatural that happens. I mean, think about your own story. If you were to tell me some of your greatest childhood memories, how many of them involve sitting around a campfire and roasting hot dogs together? Or sitting at grandma's table for Christmas dinner? Or having everyone to your house for Thanksgiving? How many times of those stories do you remember, those special moments, that there's a meal that was shared together that's involved? But I don't need just your intuition. I can give you research, too. From Oxford University to Harvard University to Gallup polls, it's been studied dozens of times. Do you want to know what the number one indicator of mental health in teenagers is? Whether they'll grow up to be self-confident and self-assured, whether they'll grow up to struggle with depression and anxiety. The number one indicator is how many times they eat dinner with their families during the week. It has direct ties to depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorders, drug, alcohol, tobacco use, grades in school, number of friends, that you can look at how many times a family eats together and go, man, that kid's at risk or that kid's gonna be okay. Because when you eat together, it builds this bond of attachment that I know I am loved, I'm cared for, I'm connected to these people, and if I have that attachment with them, then I don't have to try to get it other ways. And so you can just, when I did counseling with families back when I was doing youth ministry, and families would come in and go, man, my daughter turned 13 and she lost her mind. The first thing I'd say is, yeah, she's a 13-year-old girl. That's what happens. It'll come back in about three years. The second thing I would say is, how often do you eat together? Well, we're really busy. We got cheerleading, and we got gymnastics, and we got this. I don't care. Find the time. And the very first piece of advice I'd ever give any family is you need to eat together at least four times a week. I don't care if you got to get up early and eat breakfast before everybody leaves. I don't care if you got to do Sunday afternoon dinner. I don't care if you got to eat at 9.30 at night, pizza on the living room floor. You need to be together and talk about your day and connect because that will make so many other things better. But it's not just with kids, it's with adults too. Oxford University study revealed that the adults who feel most self-confident, most loved, happiest with their life, most satisfied with their job, all regularly ate meals with adults outside their home. Because it just does something when we share table fellowship with people. It connects us, it unites us, it makes us feel accepted, it validates us. Something happens when we share table fellowship with other adults. And Jesus knew this. And he used it as a tool to welcome and validate people. I can't explain it, but I can illustrate it for you. So we're going to do a little demonstration today. A little science demo for you. Okay? Somebody tighten my screw down. I'm not that short. All right. Hopefully the wind doesn't blow over my really expensive glass vases. Stay. All right. I got here two pitchers of water, and I color-coded them to make it easy for you. We're gonna pour cold water into this pitcher, or into this vase. Very dramatic, exciting. <laughs> Are you not entertained? <laughs> so if the blue one was cold water, anyone wanna take a guess what's in the orange one? Ah. Yeah, warm water. Lava, not quite lava. Let's, just, let's do it this way, it'll be a little faster. But you can see the steam coming off that bad boy. Roughly the same amount of water, roughly the same, well, the exact same glass base. Only difference is the temperature. Now here's a cool thing that will happen. I'm gonna take some food color. And over here in the cold one, I didn't have blue, so I'm going to add three drops of green food color. And that food coloring will start to mix in, start to blend, you'll see it start to come down. And over here in the hot one, again we're color coding for simplicity, I'm going to drop in three drops of red. Now I don't know how well you can see from where you're sitting, but something's going to become very clear in a moment. One of those is going to mix together much, much faster than the other one. Can you tell which one yet? Which one? The red one. The red one, you can almost see a current. If you were up here, you can see it 
kind of swirling around as it goes in. Now that's not because I put magic red food coloring in. It's for this reason. When something is hot, you may not know this, but what we're measuring in the temperature is actually how fast the particles in the water are moving. So the cold water, they're kind of like you are right now. Man, it's cold. I don't really want to move. Somebody give me another blanket. Okay? But those hot particles, they're over there going, Woo! I'm excited. It's hot. Woo! Yeah, let's move. And as the particles move, it causes that food coloring to mix in nearly twice as fast. Okay? It's already, you can see this is already uniform. It's all, there are no swirls left. This is completely mixed in. This one is still kind of, uh, I don't know what I want to do today. So I can explain to you the science of why that happens with water and food coloring. I can't exactly explain to you the science of why Table Fellowship does that to us, but I'm telling you that Table Fellowship has this effect, that when you sit with other people and share meals with them, it accelerates the relationship and the bonding. It's why our ministry, like you look at our church calendar, we've got men's dinners and ladies' luncheons, and we went dinner together every Wednesday night. We had breakfast this morning because I know that when someone new comes to our church, they can sit in church for six weeks and not know anybody. But if they show up and have dinner with us on Wednesday night, they're going to leave and they're going to have three or four people that are like, oh, I had a nice conversation with that guy. I kind of, I think we could get along because it just accelerates that process. So the first thing we notice when we look at Jesus' ministry is just how much this was a regular part of what he did. The second thing you should notice is that Jesus did it with everyone. Did you notice when we read those passages? You know, we talk a lot about Jesus eating with the tax collectors, and he did. But did you notice he also ate with the Pharisees? Did you notice that he ate with his close, close friends on the road to Emmaus, the 12 disciples, Mary and Martha? But he also ate with strangers who invited him into their home. And Jesus would, among his own disciples, he would have Herodians and Zealots, those who loved Rome and those who hated Rome. He would eat with men and with women. Some of his supporters were wealthy. Some were fishermen living day to day. It, he had absolutely no boundaries in terms of who he ate with. In fact, in the Gospel of John, it tells us that he ate with a guy named Simon the leper. He went into a leper's house and had dinner with him, this outcast that nobody else wanted. Jesus knew that table fellowship connected people, showed love, showed acceptance, showed validation, and he used it across every social level. Here's what I find. We really like the first point. We love eating together, especially when the food's good. Okay, some scrambled eggs, some pancakes, some hash browns. That was fun. But let me ask you this. If you look back over the last six or seven weeks of your life, how many meals have you had with somebody who's not like you? Who looks different than you? Who votes different than you? Who's from a different social class than you are? Who's from a different financial class than you are? Who's had different life experiences than you have? How many times have you invited someone to your table recently who doesn't believe all the things you believe? Who doesn't agree with you in your politics? How many times have you used table fellowship to connect with someone who's completely different from you? And the answer for most of us, unfortunately, is it's been a long time. We like hanging out with people who look like us, act like us, vote like us, believe like us, dress like us, far more than we like people who are outside our comfort zone. I gotta be honest with you, this is something Candace and I used to be really, really good at. I mean, our house had people in it two, three nights a week. Kids, adults, kids from Akron City, kids from the middle of nowhere, country kids, city kids, black kids, white kids, rich kids, poor kids. I mean, our house was constantly flowing. And we don't do that as often as we should anymore. We, we, had, we added two kids to our lives, we got busy, and it just doesn't happen like it should. So I'm gonna give this as a challenge to myself and to you part of loving like Jesus loved, serving like Jesus loved. One of the, the tools in the tool belt is to spend time around a table with people who aren't like you and to show them the love of God by, by providing for them. And so I'm going to give you this challenge. You should this week, before we gather again on Sunday, inside, not outside, you can say amen later, before we meet again, make plans to share a meal with somebody 
who's a little outside your comfort zone. We may not actually be able to get together this week. I know what schedules are like. I know what it is to be busy. But make plans to share a meal with somebody who's a little outside your comfort zone. A co-worker, a neighbor, maybe somebody here at church. We've got a whole bunch of folks who've joined us just in the last four or five months that you probably don't know very well. Invite them to your house. Make plans to go out to dinner after church next week. Invite them to picnic at the park, to eat pizza after the football game on Friday. But to, to understand that this idea of table fellowship is not just so we feel good, but it's a tool Jesus used to let the leper know he was accepted, and to let the tax collector know that he was loved, and to let the Pharisee know that although God didn't like his hypocrisy, God still loved him. This table fellowship became a tool to love the world around So I just want to challenge you to live that out in your life to make that kind of plan this week. I'm gonna end with a passage from Luke 14 and then we're gonna, gonna wrap up here. In Luke 14, Jesus is telling this parable about a banquet that a guy's throwing. And at the banquet, all of the people who were invited at first have excuses, but reasons why they can't show up, reasons why they can't come. And so Jesus, as he's telling the parable, the man throwing the banquet says this in Luke 14, 14. He says, go out quickly into the streets, alleys of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. This is Jesus' picture of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of heaven is like a man throwing a banquet. And all the people who were invited at first, they got reasons they can't come. So go find the crippled, the lame, the poor, the sick, and bring them to my banquet. What does that teach us? It teaches us that Jesus longs to share the table with everyone. And the invitation extended to the rich and the successful and the poor and the broken. It's extended to the healthy and the sick, both physically and spiritually. The kingdom of God is a place where all are accepted. And if we're gonna be the love of Christ in our community, if we're gonna love like Jesus, then that means we must become a place where everyone is invited to the table. I shared a video online on Friday where I talked about you can eat dinner with any famous person in the history of the world, right? Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, George Washington. You can pick anyone in the world. And I gave what is a very cliche answer. I'd love to have dinner with Jesus. Partly because I have a lot of questions for him, a lot of things I wish he would explain to me, but also because he's the only person that I know that would want to eat dinner with me. I don't think Abe Lincoln would be very interested in me. I don't think Albert Einstein would find me very clever. But I know that Jesus would love to sit and share a meal with me. And I know this because he sat and shared a meal with Peter and with Simon the Pharisee and with Mary and Martha and with Simon the leper and with everybody he met. And he would sit down and he would long to share it with me.